Good morning. What a great time that was just to be in the presence of God together. If you don't know me, my name's Chris, part of the part of the family here at King's. And I spoke a couple of weeks ago on what Paul challenged us to do about imitating him who was imitating Christ. And we're going to pick up on that again this morning. So the, it came from 1 Corinthians 10, 33, and then the first verse of chapter 11. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And then we finished with these two questions. What does doing what is best for others so that, they, so that many may be saved look like for you and I? And if you could do anything around that, what would it be? And where this is really coming from in me is that sense, as I, I finished two weeks ago, that God's looking to, to raise an army to see the kingdom advanced across Britain in every village, in every town, in every city, in every hamlet to see his kingdom established again, to get his church going again in an increasingly broken country. You just have to pick up a newspaper, turn on the news to see the problems that we're facing in this country. And while the world is falling down, Jesus said he would build up his church and that the gates of hell would not stop it. And the invitation to every single one of us this morning is to join with him in doing that. That's the invitation and the opportunity. But who is this guy, Jesus? And in Matthew 16, 15 to 19, it says this. And then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. That's quite a good thing to be part of, is it not, this morning? How does that make us feel that that is the invitation before us today? And the challenge specifically for us this morning is to grab the keys. Malachi 3.6 tells us that God doesn't change. In Hebrews 13.8, it tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The plan has always been for God to outwork his plans via community of people. In the Old Testament, that looked like the Israelites. In the New Testament, going forward, that looks like us, the local church. That's always been his plan and his attention. And you have to ask yourself the question at times, does Jesus really need my help? And the answer to that is probably not. <laughs> I think he's quite capable of doing this on his own. But again, when you look all the way throughout Scripture, right from the very beginning to the very end, there is that desire and that call to partner with his people, which is us. And it's still the same. And Jesus was in the business of keychain leadership, one of the elements that we looked at in Going Young and one of the things that's in our vision document. I like how I managed to weave that in there this morning. I thought that was quite clever. But Going Young is one of the five pillars that you see on the, the back. I was going to say the back board. It is there. I just can't quite see the light. And it's primarily about seeing young people aged 15 to 29 raised up and to be given that opportunity, those keys of responsibility, and it might look like leading in an area. Sometimes giving over keys actually means giving over the physical key and letting somebody have responsibility for the front door and the alarm. 
that Je that's what Jesus did. He raised people up and delegated the authority. And he's still doing that today, showing that he trusts us and he wants to delegate that authority to us. And for some, you know, our initial thoughts immediately go to, I can't do that. There's no way that God would use someone like me. You've no idea what my past is like. And already Chris is freaking me out this morning. But remember, God doesn't change. And this invitation to co-labor with him goes as far back as the garden. The garden which he built and then he handed over the keys to. Genesis 2.15, the Lord placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. This has always been the plan. And I believe that that verse is every bit as relevant for today as it was when it was first written. Jesus is calling us into different places, into different settings, and giving us the keys of kingdom authority. Not to do what is best for ourselves, but to do what is best for others so that many may be saved. So things haven't changed since the garden. And if you weren't here two weeks ago, I used a quote from N.T. Wright, who's a, a well-known modern theologian. And he talks about the project of the new creation plan. And he says, it's not about salvation, sorry, it's not about salvation, but vocation. It's not about few, we're going to heaven after all, we've made it. Heaven in Romans only occurs twice, neither time in relation to a final destination, but our inheritance is the new creation which we experience now. Who we are called to be now in God's project of the new creation, rather than we'll get through this life stuff and then be glorified. Being glorified does not mean going to heaven, but it's about being taken over by God the Holy Spirit as described in Psalm 8, being a genuine human being in authority over God's world. In authority over God's world. And the invitation and the challenge to us today is do we want to be part of that? Do we want to be part of what it is that Jesus is building? And if we do, we have to grab hold of the keys that are on offer. And once we've done that, the next thing we need to do is don't be naive. You know, one of the, the tragic things that we see time and time again is people start to respond to the call of God in their life. They grab hold of that keys. They're determined. They're going for it. And then all of a sudden, troubles hit. People start to doubt and they start to give up. And it reminds me a little bit of the January joiners in the gym. And in January, every time I went into the gym, it was packed, you couldn't get near a machine. It was quite frustrating for obviously a regular gym bunny like myself. But you're having to wait to have a go on a machine. In February, it started to get a little bit quieter. It's like you have to wait less time and when I was in earlier in the week it felt like it was back to normal like it was in November time but in January everyone's excited and determined aren't we we're gonna this is gonna be the year that we're gonna change everything I'm gonna get up every morning I'm gonna do 1,000 push-ups before breakfast I'm gonna run from Milton Alleys to Longman and back again I'm not gonna take the car anymore and then by the 2nd of January that 1,000 push-ups a day is maybe free <laughs> and there's no way I'm running anywhere <laughs> but it's hard to keep going unless you do in terms of your physical strength you'll know this you're not going to grow in strength and stamina unless you actually start doing it and putting in the effort and keep going and keep going and I know, I, I know for me, it's not when I go to the gym once a week or men's fitness once a week. It's when I go two, three, four times a week, maybe not four, but two or three times a week, 
that's when I see and notice the difference. And it's the same when walking out our calling. When it gets difficult, when the cold mornings come, when you just can't be bothered, when there's something better on TV that you want to watch, that's the moments we have to push in and have to keep going. When the troubles of life come upon us, are we just going to go, nah? Or is that the moments we're going to dig deep and really push in? In Acts 14, it tells us Paul and Barnabas, they were there to strengthen the believers. And they encouraged them to continue in the faith and reminded them that we must suffer many hardships in order to enter the kingdom of God. I think sometimes in, in churches over many years, it's like, things are going to be amazing. God's amazing. All your troubles are over. God's absolutely amazing. But we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And if we are serious about imitating Christ so that many others may be saved, let's just think about for a moment what Jesus went through. In John 15, it says, Jesus says that if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. Not being naive is recognizing that we are in a spiritual battle and that spiritual warfare is real. And we read about it in Ephesians 6, first of all, verse 12, for we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and the authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So let's not be naive this morning about the fact that there is an enemy of God who wants to wreak havoc here on earth and his purpose is to try and get people to turn away from God. It's why Jesus taught his disciples and ultimately us when we were praying, deliver us from the evil one. Some of this stuff isn't a game, it's real and around us. And I've already said that God doesn't change, well you know what, neither does the enemy. And some of his tactics we need to be aware of in no particular order, and this isn't an extensive list, but been thinking about this for the last few weeks, this is what keeps coming to mind. He gets us to doubt. In the same way, in the, in the garden, when Adam was there, he was being given the, the authority to tend and watch over it, and then we read in Genesis 2, 1, this is what the enemy says to Eve. Did God really say you must not eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden that whisper that voice that lie that doubt that comes in and the same tactics are being used today calling us to doubt ourselves doubt the promises and also doubt the callings which we have had spoken over us god can't use me look at my life so far i'm too old i'm too young but regardless of our perceived ability God is still in the business of placing people into gardens and handing over the keys of the kingdom authority. And I was thinking about that during worship, that particular bit came to mind and thinking about what Mike shared at the vision morning two years ago, I think it was now, where he used the term employ my ability. <laughs> employ my ability. Every single person in this room has an ability that God wants to use to advance his kingdom. And it all looks different. But he's interested in employing your ability this morning. Or what about does God operate like that now? Like he did all those years ago. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to spend a few weeks before Christmas looking back about the outworking of the Holy Spirit. Because he does. We had testimony this morning of a miracle that's taken place. He absolutely does. In Ephesians 6, 13, the next verse on, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Bible quiz time. Who can remember what the first piece of armor was to put on us? Okay, there's about 15 different answers there. <laughs> B 
belt of truth. <laughs> We're going with the belt of truth. <laughs> but the belt of truth, I think, is so key. Because the main battle for us that we face every single day is not the unseen world or in the, even this dark world around us or in the heavenly places which we can't con even get our mind around. But it takes place in our mind. How does Jesus describe the enemy in John 8? The father of lies. He prowls around telling lies about us and lies to us. And this is uh, something I heard Bill Johnston from Bethel Church say yesterday. It's subtle, parading his thoughts as virtuous ones to get us to engage with them. That's what he does. And every time a doubt comes to mind, we need to be asking ourselves, does this line up with what the Bible teaches me about who God is and also what it says about who God has called me to be? A co-heir with Christ, adopted into his family, made right with God because of our faith in Jesus, but not, and not through our own acts, placed into the equivalent, the equivalent of our garden to serve others so that many may be saved. The next thing we need to be on the watch out for is getting us to compare. And I touched on this a little bit last time, the difference... To, to the, they need to imitate, not compare. And this thing around comparison is an even bigger problem than today than it probably was back in Paul's time because we have the, the social media and everyone puts their highlight reels on social media. But we can get caught up in comparing ourselves to those around us, the celebrity Christians that we see on TikTok or Instagram. And in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says, he doesn't see himself as, in, as inferior to the super, super apostles around him. And neither should we. But I think often this can come from thinking about other people's dramatic tem testimonies or perceived success. Maybe it comes from com comparing ourselves to characters in the Bible who've had these dramatic encounters with God when the, the They've, the, the, the revelation for them has come. We think about Moses and that encounter with the burning bush. I've never seen a burning bush. Mary had the angel Gabriel. I've never seen the angel Gabriel. Last time we talked about Paul's Damascus Road experience, I've never had an experience like that. And one of the problems can be when we read about those types of encounters or hear other people's amazing testimonies, I think sometimes we begin to think that that's normal. I haven't had an experience like that, so therefore God can't be calling me or speaking to me because I've never experienced that. And back into doubting we go. And the Bible is full of incredible stories about incredible things that have happened to incredible people. But I always think about this verse from John 21, 25. Jesus also did many other things if they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. And that's obviously referring to just Jesus' time on earth, not what happened before or what's happened since. So what about all the other stories that are not in the Bible of the ordinary faithful people that faithfully and obediently served? When we were in Albania last year with Adopt a Child, we met some incredible people doing some incredible work. And most people will never know of them or know anything about them or what they do as they do what's best for others so that many may be saved. But we don't need to compare. We just need to be obedient to what it is that God is saying to us. And in terms of how we hear that revelation from God, I suspect that for most of us, we hear God like Elijah did. In 1 Kings 19, it says, Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. 
And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. We sometimes miss what God is saying because we're busy comparing our experiences to someone else's. And for most of us, we encounter God in the quiet, everyday life as opposed to the dramatic the next thing we need to be on the lookout for is jealousy. Doubt leads to comparison, which can lead to jealousy. And when you think about the enemy himself, the reason why he got kicked out of heaven with a third of the angels, because he was comparing himself to God, he was jealous of God. He wanted to be God. And I really enjoyed what Elaine brought last Sunday, the story about Jephro looking at leadership and serving. And Moses is trying to basically lead in too many people and do too many things. His father, Jephro, told him to put people into smaller groups with other people overseeing them. Some are to oversee groups of 100, sorry, 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. And you can't help but wonder those who were asked to oversee 10, how they thought about someone who'd been asked to oversee a 1,000. Did they start to doubt their ability? Why haven't I been asked to look after a 1,000? I've only got 10. That guy over there has got more than me. I'm now comparing him because I'm jealous because he's been asked to do something more than me. This is what the Bible says about jealousy in 1 Corinthians 3, 3. For you... For you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? So we need to really watch out for this thing of jealousy. And while being asked to oversee a thousand might sound great. Oh, I'm the big man. I've got a thousand people to look after. Remember Jesus went with 12 <laughs> And if we think about our own journey, I suspect for the majority of people in here, they will say that they grew more that when being part of a small group than a large one. We tend to grow far better as part of a small group than a large one. And for those leading small groups, light life groups, I would say it's one of the most rewarding areas of ministry that you can do. To actually journey with a small group of people over a period of time. And then the last thing to look at is sexual immorality, at which point everyone's ears suddenly perked up again. <laughs> and again, the mind is our battlefield, so what are the thoughts that we allow to take root? Maybe our relationships with husband, wife, boyfriends, girlfriends. You know, sometimes it's not always plain sailing. We start to compare ourselves. We start to get jealous. We allow thoughts that shouldn't, that are not good to take root. And I'm not going to say too much around this other than this, that when I was looking at First Corinthians before Christmas and that little mini-series about the outworking of the Holy Spirit, the issue of sexual immorality kept coming up. And Please feel free to fact check this one. But if I've, if I've done my research correctly, five times it comes up in 16 chapters, more than any other book in the Bible, which is also the same book that talks about the gifts of the Spirit more than any other book. I'm going to suggest that's not a coincidence. So there are some of the enemy's tactics that we need to be on the lookout for. And what happens when we encounter them? I don't know if you remember these bracelets that were, they look nothing like that. <laughs> Imagine for a minute those little bracelets you used to get with WWJD on them. Remember them? What would Jesus do? Jesus regularly spent time, it's all right, John, don't worry about it if it's not there. 
that Jesus regularly spent time in prayer with the Father. Worship for me has always been a fantastic way of drowning out the voice of the enemy, cranking it up as loud as you can. I thought what Linda shared a couple of weeks ago about what her and Dave have been doing in terms of communion on a daily basis, all these things are taking us back in to the presence of God. The importance of knowing and really knowing our Bibles. When Jesus would have been tempted in the desert, how does he respond to the father of lies? He keeps quoting the truth of scripture. So we have to know it. If we're going to counteract the lies of the enemy about who God is and what God says about us, we have to spend time in the word. Serving and giving, whether that's financially or our time, what that does, it takes our eyes off ourselves and starts to focus our attention on what is best for others so that many may be saved. And then accountability. Make sure that we've got good, solid people in our lives that are really asking the difficult questions and that we're being really honest with them. And nothing that I've said so far is difficult, rocket science, or nothing new from what you've probably heard a thousand times before, but sometimes we just need reminded of it. And then lastly, let's not be afraid. Because grabbing the keys to the kingdom and dealing with an enemy that's out to kill and destroy, it actually might sound a little bit overwhelming or even scary. Especially as we begin to consider that second question, if we could do anything around all this, what would it be? We need to be aware of an enemy, but we absolutely don't need to fear him. Another name for the enemy is the accuser. And I I read this uh, a couple of weeks ago and it, it made me smile. Zechariah 3 Verses 1 and 2, the angel showed me Jeshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Saint Satan, was there at the angel's right hand making accusations against Jeshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes, rebukes you. I just love that bit. I, the Lord, reject your accusations. <laughs> because when we have been made right with God through our faith in Jesus, the accusations don't stack up. When we've been made right with God through our faith in Jesus, the accusations do not stand. Don't worry about what he's saying. When we have been made right with God through our faith in Jesus, And the other reason we don't need to be afraid is because the promise he made us, and again, this will be so familiar to so many, but sometimes we need reminded of it. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Not just some, not just a bit to get him going. (laughs) I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Go. And make disciples of all the nations. We've been praying for our own nation this morning. The call to us is to go to all the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm not with you on a Sunday morning. Or a Wednesday night in life group. Well, he is. (laughs) But I'm with you always. So it's way beyond just an encounter we have a couple of times a week. And the one who has all the authority over all the heavens and all the earth has promised to be with us and is now inviting us to go. So as we consider doing what is best for others so that many may be saved, what that actually looks like for us as individuals in a church, we can be confident that as we grab hold of the keys, that God is right with us. You know, the last two preachers have come out of me being in a place where I've been fed up with the status quo. 
desperate to see us experience a move of God like we've never experienced before. That sense that God wants to raise up an army that advances the kingdom, not just in Inverness, but in every city, village, town and hamlet across the nation. What does that look like for you in the garden that you have been placed? Because the command is to go. And it's not about getting busy people already to do more. For some of us, we're going to need to lay down the old thing we've been doing to pick up the new. But who are we called to be in the now as part of God's new creation plan? What does that look like for every single person in this room? As someone who's a modern day Indiana Jones... <laughs> Someone who works in the dental surgery. For the teachers in the room that are in our schools. For those that are in the building throughout the week. With the many, 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 many families that are coming in the door every single week. What does it look like in a hair salon? What does it look like for someone making jewellery? What does it look like for us to be part of this? And I'm going to invite Helen and the band to come back now. And this might seem a little bit random, but I'm a little bit random, so here we go. I think sometimes we need a physical response to demonstrate to ourselves that we're actually going to do something. I can get up here and I can have the most elegant talk in the world and you go, oh, it was very nice and I wonder what time's dinner. (laughs) But what happens beyond today And I think sometimes we need a physical step to actually get up off our chairs and do something as a commitment to ourself and a way of dispelling the doubts that we might have. It's a bit like when when God said to Moses, I want you to lift up your staff over the Red Sea. God didn't need him to do that, did he? But it was partnering with God in that moment, that physical act of obedience that created the faith in Moses that then allows him to go on and lead the people. And I started by saying, I think we need to grab the keys. And I thought about giving you everyone a, a key to the building here, but I thought I might get into trouble for that. But I do have a pile of keys this morning. And they're all different and all slightly unique, I guess a bit like all of us here. Some of them are quite big. Some of them are a lot smaller than the picture on Amazon suggested. (laughs) I probably shouldn't have just gone for the cheapest one. (laughs) But I'm wondering if you'd be brave enough this morning as the band starts to play to actually come and take one of these keys as a commitment to yourself and in response to what God is calling us to do recognizing that these keys are just bits of metal in one respect, but they're symbolic. That Actually, I want to take hold of the kingdom authority that he has given me in the place that I'm going Monday to Friday. And then thinking about that questions, what does this look like for me? Thinking about the things that are on your heart, your dreams, your passions, What we want you to do is to write them down and then pray about it over the next few weeks. And as you want to action some of that stuff has come to start to speak to us as elders, your life group leaders, deliberately not getting you to do that now because we don't want a response that comes as uh, any sense of pressure or obligation or I feel sorry for Chris so I better do something. not something that comes out of the noise of a Sunday morning but in a response to the whisper of God beyond today what is it that he is calling you to do in this next season think about it write it down pray about it and come back to us but in the meantime I wonder if anyone wants to pick up some keys this morning if you do now's your time